Tom, I, uh, hi. Hi, Pete. How are you? I'm good. Very good. Thank you. I stumbled on some things. This is, uh, you know, sometimes I, when we come to these shows, I bring you uh, an article of some sort of news, right? Something uh-huh. that's of, of use to us as human beings, even if uh, not pleasant to, you know, talk about. Yep. I don't have that today. Oh. I stumbled on a Reddit post. Okay. Yeah, that's what I do with Reddit. <laughs> Cuz I generally I have anxiety <laughs> about Reddit. Like I fear Reddit. It is a scary it's a scary town. Oh, really? Why? And cuz you never know, one click and you're in the part where people hate you. And I don't like that. And so I tend to I I'm not an avid user of Reddit, but I I do sometimes stumble upon it and I found a Reddit thread that asks a question that is already uh, anxiety inducing question like i'm going to read you the question and i i hope you'll feel right along with me and then i'm going to read you some of the posts which okay. take it and which are much much worse and i would just like your commentary on uh some of these uh, posts i think this will be okay. a fun little game the question what is a fact that you think sounds completely false and that makes you angry that it's true <laughs> A fact that sounds false, but when it's true, it makes me angry. Okay, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, The first one is uh, actually... It's very surprising. Reddit's usually just so calm and not reactionary (laughs) and not just eating rage sandwiches all the time. That's exactly... Remember that time that Reddit solved that crime? Never. Yeah. Wrong. (laughs) Never. All they do is point at the wrong people. Yes, exactly right. All right. So a fact that you think sounds completely false and makes you angry that it's true. The first one is that it turns out the word warmth has a direct uh, opposite. Would you like to know what the opposite of warmth is? I would. It's cool. No, it's not. Yeah. (laughs) Cool. Yeah, It, it is. Yeah. The pleasantly low temperature, the cool of the evening. That's from the Oxford English Dictionary. Cool. Cool. Because it has the word cool in there, I'm actually pretty good with that. Yeah. I like it. Because, and cool. actually, that's one of the informal uses. It is the pinnacle of 1960s cool. <laughs> it's kind of hard to say. You sort of feel like you're swallowing your tongue when you do it. It's cool. terrible. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Chemically, rhinoceros horn is identical to human fingernails, so biting your nails gives you as much health benefit as powdered rhinoceros horn would. That grosses me out a lot. (laughs) I don't think you should do it, and I don't actually know what the benefit of rhinoceros horn is. That's what I was going to ask, is that uh, it's probably an aphrodisiac. Everything (laughs) seems to be an aphrodisiac (laughs) somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, How about this? Okay, Tom, so those are, we're just sort of playing around with those. The ones that actually give me anxiety are thus. Did you know, sir, that crocodiles, you know, you're familiar with crocodiles. Uh Uh-huh. They can climb trees. Shut up. No, that's not allowed. (laughs) (laughs) That's God saying, hey, good luck, everybody. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Ugh. Crocodiles that climb trees terrorize from above and below. And of course, I want to know about this. And it turns out that this is really true. Uh, crocodiles Ugh. can climb trees. They do so at night. They climb into the canopy and then they can <gasps> crush eat you, I guess. That's oh, dear. So the good news is that the most Ugh. prolific tree climbers are the smaller, like younger agile crocodiles so uh, the big ones they don't just like i imagine the cartoon fall where they just fall mouth first open and they land on your head and then just devour you straight down (laughs) like you just just the insta swallow right from the spit out the bones like completely connected (laughs) like a heat clip cartoon (laughs) swallowing a fish yes you know what i'm doing okay so what was reported as a corollary to this thing about crocodiles climbing trees is that crocodiles are essentially immortal, right? That they <laughs> they'll never die. They just keep getting <laughs> getting bigger. And <laughs> and and so the reason they die is because their bodies essentially crush themselves from gravity, right? They just get so big. That is that true? That is true. So that was yesterday on Reddit and I was deeply concerned. Yeah, that that happened. And I think the same thing happens with lobsters, right? It just they they keep uh, growing until they are crushed under their own internal stress or they're killed. Oh, my God. Yeah. 
luckily, that's not that's true. my plan. By that's the way, that's a myth <laughs> <You just grow laughs> for until my you die. personal life. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so luckily today that has been corrected that it turns out originally posted in a vice article uh this is uh not true that croc experts have come to the rescue of truth and fact and they've said they do not grow indefinitely prevented from exceeding the size of a small moon only because they get killed by a competitor that <laughs> is not true uh the largest crocs are the ones that grow the fastest when they are young eventually their growth does slow down where the animal is not effectively getting any bigger they do also feel the effects of old age so they're not going to be falling out of trees they'll they'll actually have like sore knees and their teeth will start falling out and, and all these things they do age they do die it just happens more slowly so oh. uh they do have a 70 year lifespan and you know if we saw a crocodile chase someone up a tree i'd be like fake and now i know it's real <laughs> It's a nightmare. Yeah. So I don't know if it helps you that the crocodile, like the crocodile is actually climbing trees, but at least you know that at some point it's going to die. <laughs> a win win. <laughs> Welcome to What's That Smell, a sometimes funny podcast about humans and their anxieties. I'm Tommy Metz III. And I'm Pete Wright. And every week, we each drag one of our deepest, darkest anxieties into the light to share it, learn about it, and hopefully laugh about it with all of you. Reach out to us. We want to hear from you. Send us the story of your anxieties to listener submission at what's that smell.net. Just kidding. Which that would have been great. Exist. <laughs> nope. Instead, it's something stinky at what's that smell.net. Again, something stinky at what's that smell.net. We would love to hear from you. We're doing listener submissions all week. But first, I would like to talk about something personal. Pete, with your permission, I will go first. Hey, Pete, uh, recently, uh, not to brag, but I was invited to go to a party. Jealous much? <laughs> oh, God, so jealous. You L.A. types. My goodness. Right? Yeah. So much partying. So uh, much partying. But there was a hitch. I didn't really know the host all that well. Uh, sort of a friend of a friend of a friend situation. Mm -hmm. So naturally, that wouldn't put me... <laughs> on the strongest foundation but uh i was going with two of my closest friend husband and wife team husband somehow wife somehow team. your name yeah. is on the list somehow my name is on the list yes exactly yeah. and so i was looking forward to it because i was going with them the day of the party that was happening later at night uh both of my friends had to bail they had uh, something going on with their son and so now i had already rsvp'd yes to the party so now it's just me going alone and that's dreadful <laughs> i didn't want to do that at all uh because and we can talk about this a little bit more but if i know one person at a party i feel much much better sure. i feel like i can take on the world if i'm going in completely solo that's rough yeah and so anyways i had rsvp and i didn't want to make a bad impression and so i muscled up sort of gritted my teeth throughout the day and on the uber ride over very very i mean kind of hoping that the uber would crash like all of those kind of feelings <laughs> and then but the story has a happy ending i did go to the party and pete it was great uh i met a ton of new people um, I was able to, we played games and I was able to sort of help shepherd those kind of things. Uh -huh. I actually, <laughs> this is weird. I gave a speech, uh, at one point, just, we were sort of going around sharing things and I gave a speech and, um, at the end of the party, we were there for about four or five hours. And at the end of it, everyone voted and I was named best person <laughs> at party. Uh, everyone <laughs> applauded. They named, they sort of like named like a little trophy after me. It was great. And of course, Pete, as you've probably guessed, none of this happened. Uh, I didn't go to the party because I let my social anxiety get the best of me. Oh, uh, Tom. Yeah. I just didn't go at all. And I've honestly regretted it ever since. Uh, and to be honest, it's not the first time that this has happened to me. Um, and I guess this I is, wanted to talk about it with yeah. you because this isn't something that I found the name of. The idea of the fear or anxiety of being alone in a crowd doesn't seem to have like a clinical name, but it is something that I still suffer from to this day. I've suffered from it throughout my life. And 
it just isn't getting better. Uh, it, basically, I could boil it down to the strength I get from knowing at least one other person or a party or event is immeasurable. Mm-hmm. But conversely, the dread I feel from going in solo is sometimes insurmountable and breaks me sometimes. I yeah. didn't go to this party and I've heard nothing but good things about this party since. Do you relate to this at all? I hope I hope. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I think even more now that I'm older. And a part of that is because I feel weirdly like I know, like really know fewer people. Is that weird? Yeah. That the older I get, the fewer people I know. I mean, of course. Yeah. You know, and and it's it. And so for me, you described a thing that's horrific uh, because not only is it social anxiety, right? It's the act of being in this social situation with a lot of unknowns, but there's also like it's it's a performative place, right? You kind of have to be on your game and a performance situation is. Ugh, you know yuck and you have no social authority like you don't know anybody nobody knows why they should know you right and, social or, authority i like that term i think i, made I haven't it heard up. that before is that a thing did you that's cool i social don't know authority. i know it makes Man, sense i may be just taking credit for something that is not but we need a fact checker uh that would be awesome no no <laughs> pete the, each episode will be one minute long and the rest will be apologies well <laughs> let, let me tell you i didn't <laughs> It turns out I didn't make it up, but it's usually used in really dumb ways. Like, here's here's social authority, a measure of influence by follower wonk. Yes, that's one word. Follower wonk, I think. certainly. Yeah, I don't want to talk about that anymore. Um, In my case, like (laughs) social authority, this this thing like this experience when I go into a place and I have a reason to be there that is beyond social. Like when I go in to teach a class, I feel much more comfortable, even if I don't know anybody, because they're there to hear what I have to teach them. You have identity. I have identity. Oh, yes, that's so good. And what you yeah. just described is a thing where I have no identity. And that then it becomes a fear of like totally embarrassing myself. I there it, I I will literally think things like, what if I crap my pants? Like <laughs> that what am I gonna do? What's my escape plan if I crap my pants? Sure. Like uh, you never <laughs> know what's gonna happen. It could be a pant crapping day. <laughs> it is a Tuesday. Uh so I get it. Uh yeah. Why do you think so? But going back to the idea of like, if you know one person, yeah. why do you think that's so important? Well, I think one person is an anchor. Don't you think like one person is like a home an base? Anchor. It's like a person. Oh, a home base. Yeah. Yes. Like to yeah. even even if you go to the party together and then you start bouncing around and you somehow put on your magical social fairy wings and you're able to hop from group to group and and, you know, conquer, which I do. I usually end up doing. Yeah. yeah right. Nice. That strikes I mean, me very... as a thing you do. And and then you end up back. <laughs> you can always check in with a person when you start to feel uncomfortable. You check in with the person who gives you comfort. And that right. that's a thing of peace, which is what's so surprising to me that this would be an issue for you, because I see you as that person who is able to bounce from group to group but i don't i don't think i've ever been to a a social gathering with you well i guess obviously i've never been to a social gathering with you where you don't know anybody because i guess you always know that would be that's a logical impossibility (laughs) i sometimes stand in the bushes and watch you go to parties (laughs) not knowing People. Uh, if it helps, Pete, we can all see you. <laughs> that that becomes the topic of conversation is Bush Pete is hanging out. <laughs> and that really breaks the ice. <laughs> Bush Pete. Bush oh, Pete. <laughs> God, that Pete needs an action figure. Oh. <laughs> well, that's I I don't enjoy talking about myself in the positive. <laughs> that's probably a problem in itself. Uh no, but I I do recognize that I can be how many different ways can i undercut myself i can i can be relatively enthusiastic hopefully not too much but enthusiastic and gregarious yeah. at parties and i do like part of that comes from genuinely liking people really wanting to get to know them um hopping around and trying to impress people and make people think that i'm funny but also learn as much as i can about them well, we've talked about this before. You are funny. And that's that is an interesting thing because you're a naturally funny person. And um, I, I wonder, I, I mean, where does that come into the performance anxiety part? Like, uh, and maybe it's not just humor, but is is it that you feel this the lack of confidence when so when 
per, your perception might be that so much is more is riding on your ability to perform when you don't know anybody else? Maybe. That's interesting. I think a lot of it, because we brought up the word identity, a lot of it really, I'm not talking to other people because I'm too busy talking to myself. And what I'm talking to myself about in situations where I have this kind of social anxiety is I'm not being myself. Mm -hmm. I know I can do so much better. I know that at better is maybe I shouldn't put that kind of word on it. I know I can be so much happier right now that I am likable, that people do like me, that I am good at small talk, leveling up to medium talk, to real mm -hmm. talk, if I had the chance. But I'm not giving myself that chance because I'm too busy screaming in my own head about how quiet I'm being. And that just spirals and spirals and spirals. I think that's really, there's probably yeah. better ways to get into it, but that's really it is I can feel myself missing an opportunity to be the self that I really know I can be. That sounds kind of hippy-dippy, but does that make sense? This is really hard because I, I think some of it is an indication of like where, like why you would choose to go to a party like this if you didn't know anybody. Like, what is your central motivation to wanting to attend uh, th this party? Let's assume that you didn't have any of the social anxiety. Why would you want to go? Well, here's the thing. Another big thing that I have a problem with in my life that I believe we've talked about before, I have trouble connecting past success to future confidence. Oh, yeah. And so, but the, the rational part of me knows I usually am ultimately able to make a friend or, you know, at least a party friend that leads to another party friend. And there's nothing better for me. When it works out, it is such a rush and a feeling of triumph and community and love and all of that it just sort of gives me a new pers uh, re updates my perspective on humanity and being out in the world giving myself confidence all of that so that's why i should want to go to the party and that's why the rational part of me still did keep rsvp because until i didn't i really thought i was going to muscle up and go to that party but yeah. instead i got addicted to that rush of relief by saying, I got a rush of relief by saying, nope, I'm not going to do it, and then traded that in for uh, regret over the next three or four days, feeling bad because I made a decision based on fear. That's that's the trick, right? Is you make yeah. a, you make a, a decision based on something that you know you're better than. And, and I know that that will only compound itself because I didn't, quote unquote, conquer my fear for this situation that's going to potentially make the next situation even harder because this unknown that is not rational that won't happen is getting even worse <laughs> totally totally yeah. it's a thing that compounds and then you run into fewer things to say when you finally get over that and you get there and the only way you can figure out how to enter a new conversation is to walk up to a group and say you know people say i'm great once they get to know me <laughs> <laughs> very it's a very attractive thing to do yeah 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 my way of doing it is i purposefully crap my pants before i walk <laughs> in because i'm taking the guesswork out of it yes i yes. wear my special party pants right i'm in i think the real problem is after you finish crapping your pants and and we could talk about this in terms of the uh metaphorical pant crapping that is going on mm. in your head as you're not talking to yourself is you're oh yeah it, it's, a, it's a metaphor yeah <laughs> Is is that you're over analyzing like your thoughts and and feelings, right? You're you're overusing your own, uh, you know what they call social intelligence, right? Is is that you are you're thinking way too much about what you see, what you observe, how much fun other people are having. This is the this is the Instagram problem. It's yes. like everybody around right. you is having Instagram <laughs> quality moments with each other, and you're not uh, part of it. Yeah, like that's a better way of saying because I I termed it as screaming at myself. Yes. That's right. Yes, and that in my head, I'm having a full on monologue. Yes. And because yeah. you are a naturally humble person, like you don't really like talking about yourself, you, you can't figure out a way to engage people at a level that would spark interest in in you. And I'm, now I'm saying you, I'm sort of the royal you. I mean, I know that's what I'm thinking. And um, that's when I go into complete vapor lock <laughs> what do you mean by vapor lock? and i move i move from i move from metaphor to literal if you know what i mean <laughs> oh got it in the pants department <laughs> i get it in the downstairs area <laughs> do you have any thing that you have learned about how to get over it or do you just try to avoid it going to parties solo 
Well, or events. So. Okay. So I want to get back to that question that I asked you before, like your motivation to go to the parties. And, and this oh, yeah. is, this is the thing that, that, that I guess is my one tip. And it's a tip that probably doesn't sound all that great when you're trying to come up with a, a reason to actually go to parties. But m- for me, it's to be able to stop and reflect. Why do I want to go to some, some party where I am, uh, you know, where I, I feel so bad. Like, this is not my tribe. This is not a social situation that uh, fuels me. This actually drains me, the odds of doing that. And the potential for going to this thing and meeting some new person, some new business associate is, you know, if if I can't truly rationalize the reason to go, then I have to give myself permission to not go and not feel bad about it. Like, it's only really fun when I can hang out with the people that I know and love and know that they love me and then meet people and expand my group as a result of that. But I just choose. And this is a weird tip. Like, I just choose to give myself freedom to feel okay about not going. (laughs) That never occurred to me. (laughs) I completely went at this of like how to overcome this hurdle. And and you're saying just. I'm saying don't. Don't overcome the hurdle. (laughs) But everything in my core says that I'm being weak and I have to be a big strong boy in my big strong boy pants. I would say I would just suggest that if you were to reprogram that a little bit and say, look, I I know exactly who I am and I am going to like there is no should about it. Should is like the ultimate four letter word. I, I feel I get really riled up around shoulds because and I notice it as a because I use it as such a negative in my life. Like, ugh, I should or I shouldn't eat that thing or I should, you know, go to the gym more. And and as a result, I feel terrible when I don't go to the gym or when I do eat that thing. Uh, but when I stop and reflect on, you know, the real reason reason then and take out the should uh then i'm able to kind of reflect more authentically on my my motivation like why do i really want to go to that party i know there are a thousand things that i would rather do that are <laughs> luring my attention maybe it's just okay not to go it i mean a lot of the things that i do do does come out of social obligation yeah and i don't use that word enough but if it is a social obligation, then yes, maybe that it would be a reason to rethink it and see what am I really getting out of this? Or if I am I just tap dancing because I feel like I need to put on a show? Yeah, it's yeah. a good point. Um, on the other side, though, it's not just parties. What if it's like a work event? Yeah, I where do- you just don't somehow know, you know, like there are certain situations where you can't really not go. Yes. And and there I think there's a certain amount of, you know, th- there's a certain skill that comes from making an appearance. Right. Mm -hmm. And and some people I know are really good at making an appearance. And I think as a result of uh, largely of my anxiety around these kinds of situations, it's one of the things I think I'm pretty good at. Like, I I feel like I know how to go to an event that is obligatory and put my face in front of the people who need to see that I made an appearance and stay there just long enough and sneak out when it's appropriate. (laughs) You're gaming this entire anxiety, and I kind of <laughs> dig it. This is not how I thought that this would go, but yeah. I don't mind it. I, 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 when I was 30, I would have been all up and down, like trying to figure out how to change who I am. And now that I sure. am squarely in my mid 40s, it's time for me to appreciate who I ended up as. Yeah, and and just be okay. At being yeah. that guy, I recognize I have an enormous amount of anxiety around this, but I also recognize that the social events that I enjoy the most are the ones where my uh, friends are that that I uh, deeply love and know that we have a common um, frame of reference. And I also do I don't want it to come off like I don't enjoy meeting new people. I, I also love meeting new people, but there is a context that I'm aware uh, that I am really on good. your terms. It, it is on my terms. Throwing right. yourself exactly into a an arena if that's how it strikes yes. you. Sure. And I also really uh, like being the the gateway for other people into my social group, right? I mean, when I meet someone, uh, you know, when I, I actually connect with someone at new, I like bringing them and introducing them and meeting them and going to movies with other people and introducing them and trying to network them into uh, into these things, uh, but but doing it sort of on my terms. I think a lot, as, as is the answer to a lot of the things that we talk about, and to actually the, just the last thing that I wanted to wrap this up with is something that I've been desperately trying to remind myself as much as I can 
a lot of what you're talking about is just being kind to yourself. Yeah. To get, staying away from shoulds when you can. And if you can't, realize there's no spotlight on you. Right. When you walk into this party, you, uh, it is so, such human nature to know that everyone is looking at you and noticing that you're not talking to anyone. Or if you're me, and whatever cool words you use to say that I'm screaming at myself, <laughs> why aren't you talking to people? <laughs> no one cares. There's always other yous at every event, every party. If you can find them and be nice to yourself in admitting some of your vulnerability, if you want, of yeah. say, hi, do you know a lot of people at this party? I don't. That's okay, because almost everybody will be kind to that, yeah. will want to engage with that, even if it's just to say, yeah, I don't either. What do you do? What do you do? And then you're off to the races. That's fine. But just being kind to yourself, putting the spotlight off of yourself, uh, it can make a lot of things really go well. And when in doubt, don't leave your house. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a DVD player, right? You've got Netflix. <laughs> You don't Netflix have a dog, get a chill. dog and just yeah, yeah that's Netflix right. and chill Netflix with and chill. yourself. With yourself. <laughs> that's 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 a shirt, right? <laughs> we can make that into a t shirt. <laughs> Today's regret, Tom. Today's regret is brought to you by something that I did in real life and I regret it horribly. And it actually <laughs> involves you. Me? Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> okay. I'd like to set the stage. Uh, my uh, son's school, the Media Lab department at my son's school, middle schoolers, seventh and eighth grade. You, you know, seventh and eighth graders, you work with kids of this uh, age, don't you? Yep. Yeah. I do. So you know kind of their demeanor, uh, their sort of humor, uh, you know their level of engagement when adults try to speak to them. You, you have a sense of what I'm talking about. <laughs> sure. Okay. So I was invited to bring the mics, to set up the laptop, to get on the big screen and maybe do some, do some, you know, back and forth podcasting with some of the kids. It was great. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It was really fun. And as a demo. And regret free, it sounds like. <laughs> As a demo uh, of this experience, I was asked to play some of the podcasts that I've been editing. I opened up Logic on the big screen, and as it happens, I'd been working on episode 301, which is the first episode of our third season. Uh, I don't know if you recall what we talked about. It was some time ago we talked about ASMR, and uh, oh, yeah. that was that was a good, uh, a fun time. Fun time was had by all. I think poop was mentioned in the episode, yeah. so I got some people kind of laughing. And, and one of the uh, enterprising uh, young woman in the back of the room said to me, uh, raised her hand, and she said, who is your partner on that podcast? They were asking about you, Tom. Oh, cool. And I said, why, that's Tommy Metz. And he is a screenwriter and a director in Los Angeles, California. And he just finished his first feature film. <laughs> and then I said it. It's an adult sex comedy. <laughs> And, you know... No part of you stopped yourself? No, because then they they start laughing, and I realize what happened, and I say, wait, I mean, you know, it's not porn. My friend doesn't... It's not... I mean, you get it. You get it. Right? You get it. Oh, no. You put us both on a watch list somewhere. <laughs> Here's listeners is something you won't regret. Today's podcast is brought to you as always by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash scent of a podcast. There's hundreds of thousands of titles to choose from for all of your devices. Now let's break this down again real quick. It's a free trial. Pete, how exactly does that work? Well, you go to audibletrial.com slash scent of a podcast and you sign up right? You sign up for your account. And that account is good. You don't have to pay a thing for that first 30 days. And while you're there, you get to choose whatever book you want. You download the book to your device and you get to keep the book. If you decide, hey, I don't like Audible at the end of that period, you end your trial, you keep the book. And most importantly for us, you help support us through this deal. So again, it is www.audibletrial.com slash scent of a podcast. Pete, in the first segment, we talked about parties and how great they are. I would like to suggest a book that I listened to on Audible recently. It's an older book, probably one that everyone has read in high school but hasn't revisited. I love it. It is The Great Gatsby 
by Ooh. F. Scott Fitzgerald. He wrote this and then nothing else that was very good. But The Great Gatsby <laughs> was fantastic. Um, and it's kind of fun because it has to do with a lot of parties being thrown in 1920s New York where everything is glitzy, everyone is excited, and everyone is quietly dying inside. So that's a lot like... <laughs> That's a lot like what we talked about in the first segment. So it's four hours and 49 minutes. Guess who narrates it? I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Jake Gyllenhaal no. narrates it, and he won an award for it. That's It's an Audi out. Award finalist. Wow. And so I think you guys should give it a try. The Great Gatsby. It is a bite-sized, as I said, four hours and 49 minutes. Give yourself a gift. Be nice to yourself and try audibletrial.com slash scent of a podcast. It's a free trial. You can throw it back in their faces. They don't care. Just give it a try and help support us. Tommy, when yes. we started this morning, when I started this morning, I had this little bit that I wanted to do with you as I began my portion of the show. And I realize now, after our conversation about your portion of the show, uh, how wildly uh, off base it was. So I'm going to do it anyway and oh, just see okay. how you react. Okay. okay. So here we go. Do you hit a lot of fancy L.A. parties, Tom? <laughs> I only feel comfortable solo. If I can fly in in my party pants, I'm doing great. Yeah, like you know, when you really are in the mood to frolic. You know what I sure. mean? Like you call up you call up Charday and you you Chardé, get some yep. tortilla chips and fresca and yep, uh, tortilla you, chips, fresca and Charday. Yeah, you drive oh. up for that real valley swank. That is yep. so good. Uh I I, I struggle a little bit with this one. Uh, I, I offer you a listener submission uh, today. Oh, good, Tom. I, good, I good, think good. I think this is. I think you will have opinions, uh, and and I also think it's a fantastic spinoff to what we just finished talking about. Uh, and and I'm eager to hear how you think about this. So I shall oh, okay. I shall commence the reading. Please. Hi, guys. Long time listener, first time caller. I wanted to share my anxiety of being quote too much. Or more specifically, the act of being more effeminate, big, loud, or gay than others can or should be expected to handle. <laughs> a for instance might be watching Queer Eye, and when Jonathan is doing his Yes, honey, those extensions are fierce and gorgeous routine, my instinct is to want to tell him, Shh, you're going to make others uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> or for myself, there's an instinct to repress urges or be flamboyant or overly joyful or overly exasperated. Too many strong emotions will upset others, or at least that's the thinking. This also filters into being a people pleaser, backing down from strong opinions, asking for what I need from friends, family, coworkers, partners, and an overall mm. dislike of what I perceive to be whiny or otherwise unbecoming of a man behavior. Any thoughts, friends? Sincerely, a self-mansplainer. Self-mansplainer. <laughs> First and foremost, uh, listener, thank you so, so much for uh, contributing that. That's yeah. that's a lot, but it's very interesting. Yeah. And I can definitely relate to at least one part of it. Uh, last night, I was uh, uh, having dinner with a friend, and we were standing in her kitchen. Her son was in the other room, and it was just my friend and I talking, and she had to ask me to be a little quieter <laughs> because she didn't want her son to say, hey, I can't hear the Netflix. And I realized, am I just standing in the kitchen with another person screaming? <laughs> screaming at them. <laughs> yeah, I'm known for being, my my volume can be a little bit crazy sometimes when I get excited. And when I get like really comfortable, yeah. unfortunately, my volume can be through the roof. So I can understand the idea of being too much in that way. I think I can do that, too. And I, I do it. I, I think it comes from, a, a, you know, a discomfort in social situations, even if, you know, when I'm with people that I do know, you know, spinning off of your anxiety, I, I still there's still a performative as aspect to social situations for me. And sometimes, you know, my mind gets a little lost in itself and it'll just keep talking or, you know, always feel like it has the answer to whatever is whatever conversation is oh, going on and it'll kind of over talking dominate. yeah oh okay. yeah interesting and and so that that is sort of my too much right like for for me that that over talking is too much but i also i think this is really interesting that 
um, you know, our our contributor here brings up some other things that are, you know, things that I don't have to deal with. But I think certainly the the sort of too gay, too big, too loud, too effeminate, that is something that I I come from a, a place of social privilege in that regard, that I think I am judged mm. less than um, uh, gay uh, women, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, racially diverse populations. Like, I am judged less because I'm a straight, cis, white guy, right? You know? Yeah. Um, and, and so I think I get away with more and don't have to think about that at all. Uh, in in large part, I do think about it because I'm a hot mess of anxiety, but I don't have to. <laughs> sure, right? It's a, that, it's elective. <laughs> that's that for me. <laughs> that's my privilege, <laughs> right? And, and and so it it sucks, and it also it it makes me like really reflect. I think deeply about uh, what our contributor is is talking about here. What do you think about that? Like, how does that hit you? Sexuality aside, I know that I have anxiety about my masculinity or lack of. Uh, a lot of it comes from we talked about sports in a yeah. uh, previous. And one of the things that I was going to bring up in that episode, but I didn't, uh, was that one of the things that I have anxiety about is that I still don't care about sports and therefore don't follow it and mm -hmm. therefore can't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And going back to parties and small talk and stuff, uh, that is such a uh entry point for guys at parties is to did you see the game yeah what do you think about 72 <laughs> 72 i just picked like a number you know what i mean like what do you think the chances are this weird city and animal name put together that yeah. i've never heard of right that i don't have that um and that sometimes i get uncomfortable in what seems to me like a pack of guys like oh, at a barbecue, yeah, yeah. a bunch of dudes with beer. And I'm like, I don't I'm not going to have a lot to relate to them because I saw a musical <laughs> last <laughs> night. Is that kind of like a sport? Um, so, uh, I mean, I definitely have though that anxiety, too. I want to go back to that flamboyance. Right. And, and to being loud, because I think that's yeah. the thing that really f causes uh, Normo's fear. Like if if you're in a social situation and there's somebody being overly flamboyant or loud or opinionated, that is a thing that causes that that spurs a, a sort of ancient fear. <laughs> I don't know what's coming next. I, I think opinions will be foist upon me, and, okay. and I'm I'm terrified of that. You know, I'm speaking sort of royally, and and that is the part that I I worry that my opinion on this is one that is too easy, hmm. uh, which is. Specifically to our listener, if these are people that are important to you, if you're hanging out with people around whom you are uncomfortable to be your loudest and most flamboyant self, then you're probably hanging out with the wrong people. Sure. And, you know, I think a corollary to that is if, if you are hanging out with people who don't know your most loud and flamboyant self because you've been too afraid to show it to them, then you should show them and find out if they're your people. So you can either like nest properly with them socially or move on uh, because I I feel like we are in kind of the halcyon days of social exposure. And it, it's OK if this is who you are, it's OK to be who you are and find the other people that are in your tribe who are absolutely comfortable with you being that person. I completely agree. I mean, that would be that is the end all be all of especially when you're growing into adulthood, especially now. Yeah. Ideally, that would be the case. It is the it's that instinct to repress urges to be flamboyant or joyful uh, because that expression upsets others. I think that's a totally normal response to to the, a normal fear, a normal anxiety to that. And I also think that, you know, again, this is me being, I think, too easy uh, that I think it's it it's OK to let that go. And and with the corollary that there are obviously social situations that demand a, a sort of rethinking of that, because I don't know why politics, uh, you know, uh, motivations, who knows? Uh, there there are certain people of influence and power that will naturally be of fear, uh, live in fear with those kinds of, of um, emotions being voiced right in their face and. You just have to be aware of that, I guess. But I, I am I really struggle because I come from, as I said, a place of such privilege in this topic that I don't have to um, I, I don't have to think about it. 
And, and so I need help is what I'm saying. It sounded like maybe you were saying there are certain times when you should. I know. And I, I kind stuff. of regret that because I want that, you know, of course, there's this ideal world that I want us to be in. And I want people not to have to worry about that. They can they should be able to right. be themselves. But alternately, uh, if there is somebody who is a, a gleeful axe murderer, I'd like maybe for them not to be one in all situations. I completely agree uh, with everything you're saying, Pete. And the idea of trying to put any kind of a governor on yourself in order to fit in is heartbreaking, is, of course, something that you would idealist ideally want to avoid at any time mm -hmm. um that being said i mean it sounds like when you were sort of uh describing yourself as a and your privilege what was it white cis bearded? yeah white cis gen guy like i'm i just we we're all we all wear masks Right. We have to wear masks. I wear masks. You wear masks. Sometimes those masks are fueled by anxiety, uh, like like many of mine. Some are fueled by context. Some are fueled by, you know, work requirements. Some are fueled by social requirements. We all wear these masks. And that's a sign of our adaptability, uh, you know, to what degree we are able to to, you know, change the masks. But the the thing that I the thing that I wish for this contributor is that. There is a home base uh, where y you feel like you can take off all the masks and be as loud, flamboyant, big, effeminate, gay, whatever you want to be, and not feel like you have to protect yourself or others uh, from their own discomfort, because that's that's not fair to you or the others. Right. It's not it's not fair for you to um, to have to hide some something that may or may not be important to you uh, in your most unmasked state. Uh, and uh, that's hard. That's hard to do. And I think that's a uh, it's something I've been thinking a lot about lately. Um, uh, this this idea of, you know, who's who's the real tribe? Uh, who are the people that bring you the most joy? Are they people that you really feel like you have to um, you have to be somebody else around? I don't know, Tommy, am I overthinking? No, I love what you just said, because especially with the part about masks, while you were talking, I was just listening the different parts of my life where I do wear masks. Yeah. And one of them is family. One of them are different parts of my family, my mom's side of the family versus my dad's side of the family. But I don't feel like I'm disappearing as a result. But like when you, it's sort of like when you talk to your parents on the phone, like you just sort of give them the highlight reel. Yeah. Usually certain people. And that's okay because that's what they're, for me, that's sort of what some of my family is for, is for the highlight reel. Other parts of my family, like my parents, I can talk about the harder times. Mm -hmm. Same with different kind of friends, different at work, all these things. That is a part of the human experience, and that's not something necessarily to let drive you crazy or to feel like you're lying to yourself. As long as you do have, you feel like you have a safety, like you were saying, a tribe. Mm -hmm. A home base. Again, a home base. A home base. Well, and in I think order, that's, th that's a thing that I that, hear from uh, that one that one other person at the party, the yeah. party of life that's with right. you. If you have that, then that's OK. Yeah. And, you know, it's an interesting sort of counterexample. You said something in a party like uh, you, you don't have to worry when you go into a party. There is not a spotlight on you. Right. right. And, and I immediately thought, as you said that, as you made that point, th there is no spotlight necessarily at the party unless there's a literal spotlight, you know, I guess. Uh, and but, then it's a weird party. Then it's a weird party. <laughs> uh, but there is darkness. Like you can absolutely find the shadow and you can mm. live in that shadow um, if you want. Mm. And that's the that's the metaphor for life. There's, there's not a spotlight on you day to day, but you can absolutely find the darkness. Uh, and and so your choice is and, and this is the um, the thing that I hear from you know, friends and friends of friends who, you know, live in in other non privileged social communities and cultural communities than than mine, that they struggle with the fact that they feel like they have to be in the darkness uh, because them living in any sort outside of any sort of shadow uh, causes discomfort to those around them to the point that they feel like they have to hide and be protective of, of who they are. And that that's the thing that that I think is is it why it's so important to to find the tribe that you can take off the masks around. That's nourishing. Yeah. I have never read the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> to tell you, I'm not a student of the Bhagavad Gita. But I there's a, a passage from the Bhagavad Gita that was, I, I have heard before, I've heard many times and was just quoted again on the radio uh, on uh, NPR. And I find it okay. rings really true here. It is better to live your own destiny imperfectly than to live in imitation of somebody else's life with perfection. 
Oh, I know. I know. Gross, I like right? No, I liked it. No, it's so, was... it's so right. It's disgusting. I know. It is better to <laughs> reign in hell than serve in heaven. Is that the same <laughs> kind? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that's what Vishnu was talking about, right? <laughs> Uh, yes. Thank you again so much, listener, for submitting to this. I mean, it's this is a broad topic, and yeah. it definitely, as like everything else, you are not alone. And I don't feel that the 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 fact that you feel like you feel the need to wear masks sometimes should not make you feel like an alien. They. It's been a year uh, since we talked about our cartons of milk theory of cultural affiliation, yep. uh, and. I, I have I can tell you I've I reflect on this stuff often uh as a result of that. And all I can hope is that there are um you know, that your tribe is full of people who reflect on this equally often. Um uh, yeah. because it's it, it actually is fantastic. It is just fantastic to be able to to do that and not exasperating. It's not fearful. It's open uh, you know, truck with new people. Everyone has to wear their party crap pants. They have to zest it up. <laughs> Wait a minute. What is it? What are your party crap pants? Because I think you've just added to our merch line. Oh, it's the it's the pants you crap in yeah, right before pants, you walk in. They have to be. Yeah. You, oh, Tom. Ah, you, oh, they're that's khakis, right. Our merchandising. They're khakis or not. Maybe they're they're not pleated because that's not cool. Uh, right. And they're probably some sort of a slim leg. But inside, there's like a swim diaper of plastic. <laughs> Gross. And so it. they're your crap pants. Oh, Tom, this is fantastic. Emergency <laughs> crap pants. Go on. So your zesty party, you've got your crap pants on. The crocodiles, <laughs> the crocodiles are in the trees. Crocodiles are in the trees. Everybody is really getting down to a, a cool th jam <laughs> on the radio. Because that's what you do at parties. The you listen to the radio. Of cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh this sounds like a terrible party, Pete. Uh, Guess what? I got sick. I can't come. <laughs> that's all. Thank you all so much for joining us for this episode. Today's tune was Jungle by Moon. Coming up next week. Are, are you still in the stocks? Oh, I'm now? in the stocks. Yeah. No, okay. I'm in the stocks. Yeah. <laughs> they saw the cameras and are like, screw this. I'm going to hit everything. <laughs> Might as well. <laughs> like if Pixar made a movie about red light cameras, he would be the bully <laughs> camera that was mean to our hero camera who never took any pictures because he didn't want people to get in trouble. Until then, I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Tommy Metz III. Thank you so much for downloading. We will be back next week on What Is That Smell? Want to get right off this dress that feels within me. Oh, I want to think of my clothes and hang from a tree. To the jungle Take me back to the jungle